Welcome to Mind of a Scientist. I'm excited to introduce Steve McKagan, marine biologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everybody. So my name is Steve McKagan, uh, and like you, I am working in a virtual environment. Um, today, I'm presenting to you from my daughter's bedroom because <laughs> I'm in a mandatory telework situation, which is very similar to what you guys are doing in terms of having to learn virtually. It's been a challenging year, I know, for all of us. Um, created some new and interesting opportunities, though. So I'm happy to have a chance to talk to you from thousands and thousands of miles away. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of taste of, of what I mean by that here in a minute. I'm going to share my screen and start the presentation that we'll walk through. I think content that you've had from a variety of other scientists, probably in other fields over the last year or, or since the inception of this effort. My name is Steve McKagan. I do work for NOAA Fisheries. So if you're not familiar with NOAA, it's the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, it's a big umbrella though. We've got some uh, arms within NOAA that you're probably familiar with, like the Weather Service, but we've also got a bunch of other arms like the Ocean Services and Fisheries that you may be a little bit less familiar with. I specifically work for Fisheries, but partner across NOAA on a lot of different fronts. And I live and work out here on the island of Saipan. Uh, if I could see you guys, I'd have you do a show of hands to tell me how many of you have a clue where that is. I'll, I'll tell you right now, there are people within NOAA who I talk to that don't know where this is. <laughs> so um, Guam is a little bit more famous than us. It's the southern part of our archipelago. But above Guam, there's 14 islands in the chain. And Saipan is the biggest and most populated. But there's only about 50,000 people on this island. Um, we're most famous out here, I think, for the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean uh, in any ocean. And uh, the picture you can tell there, that's not me. That's actually the, the famous director, James Cameron. Uh, he's a bit of an adventurer himself, and he went down to Challenger Deep, one of the deepest spots in the trench, a few years back, and uh, did a little documentary and, and took a bunch of pictures and stuff. So that's a picture of him, and that's one of the reasons why we're famous out here. Um, all right, so one of the first things uh, I want to talk about is the big picture, and, and we'll go into a little bit more detail, but, but for me, uh, work-wise, the big picture has really started back in 1988 when climate change became front page news. Uh, and for me, at that time, um, it was just eye-opening that there's these huge, you know, planet-sweeping things that are driving a lot of, of what we see even in our own regions. Um, that got me excited about science. And, and I'll talk more about that journey in a minute. Um, but you can become completely overwhelmed with that big picture, especially when you're seeing the effects that it's having in your place, whether, you know, for you guys, it's more forest fires that may be uh, associated with that or changes in your local weather patterns, or in my case, changes to the reefs. Um, when I was a student your age, it was the rainforest. So um, it can become overwhelming because there are these big things and you get into the work and you want to make a difference, but you can't forget about the balance. So when you think about the big picture, you also have to think about the rest of your life and whether or not you're going to start a family or have kids or whether you've got sports that you love to do or, or other things in your life, you know, find time to read books and watch movies or play video games, whatever it is that keeps you balanced. Um, so the big picture, yes, there are these sweeping things that will inspire you, but don't forget about the other things in your life that are really important too to keep you balanced. All right, so my journey uh, really started back in high school. So I was probably roughly your guys' age. Uh, I had a teacher at Linwood High School, so that's that um, logo on the far left there, who put us uh, into these groups where we would go to the library and do our own self-directed projects. We were probably, I think, sophomores. And we were encouraged to do different modules and some were about social change and some were about environmental issues. And we got into an environmental module and did a bunch of research on what was happening with rainforests. And for me, just a light bulb went off. And I said, wow, environmental stuff is where it's at for me. I'm really interested now in, in what's happening with the ecology of the world and I want to, you know, I want to go into that. I didn't know at the time that I was going to go into the marine side of that or that my emphasis would take me all the way out to the tropics. Um, I, you know, when I started um, my journey, I stayed in Washington State. I spent a year at the University of Washington uh, before I transferred to Western Washington. And this was a, a real interesting and challenging time in my life. That first year away from home, 
uh, in college can be very challenging. Uh, I wasn't dealing with a virtual environment, but I was doing a very long commute, a uh, couple hour bus ride to get to the campus, working two jobs to try to pay for a truck engine that had just seized up, you know, life stuff. And I was really struggling with school that first year at Western, all right, sorry, at the University of Washington for me. Uh, I just, I went from being almost a straight A student to a straight B student in one quarter to a straight C student in my third quarter and realized I was in trouble. I needed to change something. So I contacted a Western Washington University where I'd also been accepted when I applied and I asked if I could still transfer as a freshman. Um, so, you know, this is way before my career as a scientist ever started, but it was instrumental in getting me here because I was able to hit the reset button. Uh, change gears, go to Western. Instead of trying to pay everything out of pocket, I decided to heck with it. I'm going to take student loans. I'm going to accept that as a debt that I'll have to pay in the future so that I can have success now. And I think that really changed my career. I spent four years at Western. I did a lot of research at the Shannon Point Marine Center there. So that got me, connected me not just with my environmental interest, but to a marine specific interest. Uh, and that catapulted me to my graduate school experience, which is which was at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So I went down there and spent a couple of years getting my master's degree, which was also an emphasis in environmental and marine science and management. Um, but when I was at Western, I had some free time as an undergrad because I was a little behind in some of the science classes I needed to take. So as I was taking those science classes, I also took classes in philosophy and religion, and I ended up minoring in those as well. So just kind of tinkering around with, with other sides of academia just to see what I liked. And I ended up continuing to take classes like that even when I was in grad school, just to keep my mind expanded and to keep thinking about things from different angles. Um, so I would encourage you as students and as you're going through this process to don't be afraid to change gears if you have to and, and keep an open mind on those other opportunities that are out there because they might inspire you. Uh, I ended up working for um, almost 10 years at UCSB in academia doing research at a lab uh, before the funding ran out. And my professor who I was working for told me that I had about a year to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I'd always been looking at something like Peace Corps. I wanted to um, get out somewhere else, see something new. And because I had made those choices about accepting student loan debt and moved out of state for grad school and paid out of state tuition, you know, all these things can kind of stack up. I didn't really have the ability to go ahead and go work for free. So I started looking though for remote job opportunities and the Division of Fish and Wildlife in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands had a fisheries biologist position that they were had, had cast a pretty wide net for and I saw it. And so I applied, it was the first job that I applied to when I realized our funding was gonna run out. And it took them an entire year to process paperwork and hire me. So in that time, I had to go on unemployment for a few months. I had to volunteer time working with some local fisheries groups in the California area and just tried to keep myself busy because I knew the job was coming or I was pretty sure, but I had no idea the challenges that some of these local governments have in terms of processing paperwork and trying to get through those hurdles that administrative and bureaucracy challenges that you'll face throughout your life and your professional life. I mean, they, you know, we can talk about being a scientist and all the cool research and stuff that you get to do, but there is so much background stuff to get you to do that one cool thing. Um, it takes a long time to get there. So after two and a half years of working with the territorial government, uh, I saw an opportunity with NOAA right here on the same island. And that gave me a huge advantage because it's very hard to find somebody with the right skill set in a small place like this. So I applied and got the job and I've now been with NOAA here in this position for 10 years. Okay, so key tips for success. I hinted at some of these, um, but if I was gonna give you four things here, um, one would be when you have a chance to take the easy class or the easy job or the easy thing or the hard thing, try the hard thing. Um, you know, take the science, take the science class for scientists, not the science class for, you know, um, for economists. Take the philosophy class that um, has the really challenging, you know, professor that everybody says, oh, he's hard, but you know, you, you, you learn a lot. Um, you know, push yourself. Um, don't, don't take the easy road because that hard road will open different doors for you. Um, also, as you're going through the process, you got to continue to embrace what's meaningful. I mentioned that the bureaucratic and administrative stuff can become a real burden. Um, it's those moments when you get to mentor students, which is what those pictures are of there. I, I mentor local students pretty much every year or you know, talk to students like you here or go out and scuba dive and collect data on a site. It's those moments that keep you inspired. So you got to continue to embrace those and prioritize those. And, and when you do get bogged down in the other stuff, you know, don't, don't forget about just around the corner is that next thing that's going to keep you motivated. 
Um, and then I talked about staying flexible. You know, you will hit barriers and you, you will need to find ways around them uh, and overcome them. And, you know, if you're getting depressed by something, start looking for your alternatives, but stay flexible. And good partners are really key. Um, throughout the process, you'll have supervisors that are great. You'll have some that are not. You'll have partners for various activities in your jobs that, that can help you move things forward. And when you find those people, continue to partner with them and nurture those relationships because those key partnerships are absolutely essential. Right. So what I do, I've talked about this a little bit, but because I run a field office out here that's very small, at most we have three full-time NOAA staff out here, and right now it's just two. So I have to run a facility. I have to do environmental consultations for the region. Uh, I do outreach like I'm doing now. Um, one of my main partners is the Department of Defense, so I have a lot of interactions with them. I get a chance to go out and do some of my own science, which we'll talk about in a minute. And a lot of that lends itself to management activities that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize in the region. So I, I wear a lot of different hats out here and just go into a couple of things that I think will be most interesting to you guys. Okay, so the evolution of my science focus. When I first came into the CNMI, I was doing fishery stuff. So my emphasis has been on scuba diving, getting in the water, understanding and learning the species of reef fish that I'm seeing here, understanding their role in the ecosystem, and then trying to understand if there's changes in what's happening in those fish populations, whether it's because of changes in the habitats, changes that are happening due to fishing pressure. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that can happen with fish. Fish are, it's a very challenging field, especially when you're somewhere where there are so many different species of fish. Um, in California, you hear a lot about steelhead, right? Those are those fish that will come into your streams that are rare and endangered. And so there's a lot of money put into those. Um, there's also a few really important fish that are uh, harvested off coast. Um, you know, we're talking about maybe a couple dozen species total. Here there's like 150 species of reef fish that are harvested just for consumption. So when you're trying to get an idea of what's happening with the fish in that space, you can't just target one or two species. You got to treat them at this, as this big complex and it becomes very challenging. So that's what my emphasis has been. But when I came over to NOAA, I realized fish are just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. And so we started thinking about managing our reefs and our fisheries, not just in a compartmentalized fashion, but as the big picture. And that's when we realized we needed to start managing for resilience is what we called it. Um, and so this is a picture of Saipan, you see the maps here. And each one of those dots is a site where we put um, a lot of extra emphasis in doing in-water research, but also understanding what was happening above those sites in the watersheds. And for each of those sites, we looked at what are the sediment and nutrient issues there? What is happening for fishing pressure there? What does the reef actually look like? How many fish did we see when we went out there and did surveys? And, and what do the coral communities look like and macroalgae communities look like in those spaces? Uh, and so we tried to take all, there are like 10 of these parameters and we tried to put them all together and understand, is that reef doing well? And what is it about that reef that's making it do well or not do well? And so in 2012, we were actually the first, uh, really the first place uh, anywhere in the world to try to use this resilience, managing for resilience approach. And so it was all very theoretical. So you can see our first map there. We went out and we tried to integrate all of these ideas. And what we came up with um, was the sites that were green were, were doing well. The sites that were red were not doing well. And within that information, we could start thinking about where we might want to recommend various management activities. And it was, um, it was somewhat hypothetical. Six years later in 2018, we were able to go back out, revisit all of those sites. And the science had changed a lot by that point. The idea of managing reefs for resilience and looking at all these different metrics had, had spread globally. And so we had to integrate a lot of new thinking and a lot of new approaches into how we uh, plugged our numbers into these models and came up with these estimates. And you can see um, that with the new information, scores changed a lot. So we oftentimes think of Saipan as like the dinosaur, right? If you look at his shape, he's got kind of a long neck and he's got a couple of little arms down low. So if you think about that shape as the dinosaur, up by the neck and head area, you can see in 2012, it was green and yellow. And most of those sites looked like they were doing pretty well based on our, our ranking. If you go back now and look at the 2018 map, the one next to it, when we got to see actually what was really happening on the reefs after six years of stress, uh, you see 
uh, we were we were not right in our estimates in 2012. The sites that we thought were strong and would do pretty well um, actually did not do that well at all over six years of stress. And some of our favorite sites um, were actually um, doing quite poorly. So the science evolved and we had to evolve and some of the management recommendations that we had put forward in 2012, we had to change gears on in 2018. Um, but this is one of the key problems with science oftentimes is you, you take your best available information because that's all you've got, you package it up, um, you put it out there for managers and other folks to see, and then you drop the mic and you think, hey, look what I did. I created these beautiful maps. Like, here's this tool. Here you go, managers, run with it. You're, go you're gonna do great. And, you know, unfortunately that's just not true. In most of these places, in most people in their jobs, they're already capacity challenged. They already have priorities. They already have funding that's coming in that they're maybe having trouble spending or they're trying to figure out how to you know, meet their requirements. And so you throwing one more tool at them that requires them to do something when they're already doing as much as they possibly can oftentimes isn't helpful. And that was one of the key lessons that we got from this process was science for science's you know, sake gets you nowhere. You have to find that connection. And more than that, you have to help create the actual activity that gets you to that next level. So we, you know, instead of dropping the ball and just saying, yeah, we're, you know, here you go, here's this encyclopedia of information. We, we did take it to the next level in our resilience work. And so these are four of the southernmost islands in the chain, Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda are the ones with um, real populations on them. And we, we went around all those islands and did the resilience work, not just around Saipan, but there too. And for each, uh, of the reef sites in each of the watersheds that we were in, we made a series of very specific recommendations for management. So we thought to ourselves, aha, not only now have we created this science benchmark encyclopedia about each reef that tells you what's happening at each reef, but we've very specifically said, here is a place where you should add some fisheries management because you have a problem with your herbivory. Or here is a place where you should really think about all of the pollution that's running off of the shoreline because we can tell that that's really affecting the reef. So even here, when we got to this level of like very targeted management recommendations for very specific places, we still ran into the same situation though, where the managers we were talking to didn't necessarily have the time or funding to jump in and take on these new projects. So, you know, it's, it's a very challenging thing. Science, you need science to get you the information to make good choices. But even when you have that information, you can't always act on it. And there's usually a big delay. So bridging that science and management is a real challenge. And it, I, I think it might be one of the things that I talk about later in a slide of like, what are the problems that make, that make you know, what I'm doing um, really hard to get through that people need to think about going forward. And definitely a better bridge to science and management is gonna be one of those things. So in 2018, you saw um, the map that looks like this one before. This is actually a slightly different map. Um, the other one was our resilience rankings. So it was those modeled scores that told you what we thought, how we thought a reef would do in the face of stress based on all those different metrics. This is very specific. This is just looking at the coral cover change that we saw around the island of Saipan in a six year period from 2012 to 2018. And the red sites uh, are sites where we lost an incredible amount of coral. You can see there, it says the percentage change is 40%. So keep in mind, most of these sites did not have more than 50% to start with. So if you had say 50% coral cover on a given reef and you lost 40% of that coral cover, you're actually now down to like 10%. You lost like 80% of your overall corals in that space uh, over this time. And the reason why we lost all these corals it actually wasn't because of pollution. It wasn't because of uh, people um, overfishing certain sites. It was almost all related to coral bleaching. And if you're not familiar with coral bleaching, it's warm water essentially sitting on corals for an extended period of time. And corals have a really important relationship with an algae that lives within them called zooxanthellae. And the algae provides photosynthetic energy to the corals and the corals provide protection and nutrients for the algae. And when things are good, corals are beautiful and colorful and growing and the algae has a great relationship with them. But when things get too hot, the chemistry gets kind of screwed up inside of the animals and 
uh, free radicals start to get formed and the algae becomes a toxin basically to the corals and the corals kick them out. So you go from very colorful corals that have all these zooxanthellae within them that provide all this color and important energy and stuff to white reefs. And that those really white reefs, which you may have seen in movies and, and other photos and stuff, they can be beautiful, chillingly beautiful even at times, but they're actually a sign that the reef is probably going to die. So we had three different episodes from that first resilience survey we did in 2012 until 2018 of bleaching. And in 2017, we had just a massive bleaching event here in the Marianas. We estimate that we lost almost 90% of some of our species um, of branching corals. So what you see here uh, on the left side, that little sea fan, that yellow sea fan is a bright bit of color on what is completely a dead reef on the southern side of Saipan. And it was just such a stark contrast. You know, we had to take a picture of it. But six years before, um, that reef was colorful. So it's like, here's the last bit of color on the reef. You know, it's, it's pretty. And yet when you understand the background, it's actually pretty sad. And on the right side there, you see a picture. They were both taken at the same spot from slightly different angles uh, in that upper part of the neck of the dinosaur of Saipan in a spot called Bird Island. And the top one, um, you can see the scuba diver in the background. Um, and it's hard underwater because col colors do get a little bit washed out, but that's a, a living reef. Uh, you can see there's a bit of a pyramid shaped coral in the background there next to the diver. If you look at the lower photo, you can see that pyramid shaped coral again in the background. And you can see in the foreground, that's that same branching acropora coral um, that you see in, in the photo above, but now it's just brown and it's covered with the lamentous macroalgae. And so here we had a shot from almost the same spot, six years apart. And in one, um, if you, you know, if you have a little bit better understanding of what you're seeing and you're looking at a little bit better picture, um, you have a bunch of living corals everywhere. And then the other one, you just have a bunch of upright structure and all of the tissue and the living corals are gone. And so in 2018, we basically got out of the water after like 30 dives uh, around the island and just wanted to cry in our masks because we'd seen so much loss. And we realized, you know, we needed to go through this process and come up with these resilience maps and integrate this information into the types of science we were doing. But we also knew that wasn't going to be enough. Um, just counting dead things doesn't really get you anywhere. And frankly, people were getting tired of hearing about it. So we needed to be a little bit more proactive and find a better way forward um, to use our energy, not just to be counting things, but to actually doing more. And so we had a big change in emphasis to restoration. Um, something that we'd seen already in the Caribbean and Atlantic. Uh, they have had a lot of different coral issues over there. Um, some of you may be familiar also with um, the stony coral tissue loss disease that's spread across that region and has killed a lot of coral, but they've also had massive bleaching. Um, they also have the invasive lionfish, which is affecting the ecology of a lot of the reefs over there. And I feel like in the US, because that area is so much closer to home, you hear a lot about what's happening in the Atlantic. And so they have had nursery and restoration efforts that are happening for more than a decade. In the Pacific, especially out here as far away as we are, uh, we thought our systems are, are different enough. We've survived some of these other environmental disasters and bleaching events that they've had. You know, maybe we're on a different, we're on a different um, tangent. We won't necessarily hit the same challenges they will. And then just boom, in that six year period between 2012 and 2018, we realized, you know, nope, we're actually not so different from them. And we're gonna need to borrow heavily from some of the lessons that they've learned and tools that they've developed. So we went ahead and jumped right in, borrowing from their nursery tree designs that they had had so much success with. Uh, and here in the left is a picture of a Holling Scholar, a student that we brought out uh, two years ago to help us set up the initial nursery. And in the time since 2018 in that work, I've changed almost 90% of my effort now is either finding funding or supporting nursery and restoration efforts in our region. Where, you know, four years ago, restoration was something completely in the background and certainly not uh, a key focus of my skill set. It now has become front and center in just about um, all of the decisions I make because so much now is requires us to reset these reefs if we want them to have a chance. Otherwise, we're going to have a completely different looking ecosystem out there. Um, and, you know, like a lot of scientists and managers, the goal really is to make sure that the students and in our kids, my daughter's, you know, four, 
uh, can go out and see the things that we were able to see when we were growing up or when we were working. Um, there's nothing worse than being a fisheries manager and taking your son out and not being able to catch a fish, right? So the idea that we have the opportunity to understand these systems, help manage these systems and hopefully give them a chance so that future generations can enjoy them is really part of what drives us and which is what has led us now to emphasizing so much of restoration. Um, and we have a, a story map about the nursery that I can also share with Milo and he can circulate with you guys if you wanna actually track and see in some more detail what's been happening with our nursery efforts out here. Okay, another question that was asked uh, as, as part of this was relevant books and films to the type of work that I do. So if you have not seen the movie Chasing Coral, uh, it won a bunch of awards a year and a half ago or so. It documented one of these massive bleaching events uh, in Australia and has a bunch of just incredibly stunning photographs um, that I, I would suggest watching that one if you haven't. Uh, another one that's a little bit more approachable and actually for slightly younger kids, is My Hog and Dream. And I, I put this one on there because it emphasizes the importance of turtles in our environment. And uh, I was actually uh, a, a key part of providing information and helping shape uh, what that documentary became. Um, I'm not in it, but there was a, a lot of coordination with my office and me directly in terms of the direction that went. And I'm really proud of the successes that they had with that documentary. Um, and then a, a couple of books that I read when I was in high school or early college that helped either motivate me or uh, I, you just charged me up in terms of thinking about the environment and the role that, that people can have in the environment. Um, there's two books by Edward Abbey. They're, they're both, well, Desert Solitaire is like a pseudo fiction. Monkey Wrench Gang is a real fiction, uh, but they're both interesting takes on, on human environmental interactions and and you know, which direction you can go in terms of trying to make a difference. And then Neil Stevenson is also a pretty famous fictional author in one of his early books called Zodiac also looked closely at the relationship between uh, what's happening in the environment in the Northeast and some industry and you know, what kind of activism could be done. A lot of these are a little bit you know, aggressive and fictitious in terms of the activists getting you know, very involved and arguably violent in terms of trying to make change. I'm not, certainly not suggesting that that's the approach to take, but it just gives you an idea of the passion that, that you, know, you can develop in terms of your interaction with the environment and trying to get to a, you know, some successes. Uh, and the next slide is the last slide that I have. And it's key problems to solve for our reefs. So when I was asked about key problems, I realized that it was probably more things that the students could actually get at and more readily wrap their head around in terms of solving in a breakout session or something like that. And these are definitely more, um, wow, let's think big picture. You know, what, what could we possibly do to make change in this type of situation? Uh, and so one of the things that we're grappling with right now in this particular field is, the search for super corals. We want to understand as we're doing restoration, which corals are the most likely to survive in this reoccurring high temperature environment that we've created. And so there's a lot of work being done to understand the genetics of what can give corals a better chance or even create corals using combinations of genetics. Uh, but there's also a lot of looking at which corals are doing okay. Why are these corals on the reefs in Saipan doing better than these other corals? And should we take those ones that are doing well, grow them in the nursery, put them back out because they have the best chance. Um, so there's a, several different approaches to understanding what uh, you know, a super coral or a super reef might look like. And, and there's some decisions to make there too. Genetic uh, modification is not something that we take lightly, you know, and it comes with risks. And so, you know, thinking about what would you do if you were gonna create a super coral would be one question I would pose. Uh, another one would be the challenges of, global warming or climate change in our, in our current thinking. Um, obviously we've had a really interesting, you know, last, what, since 1988, last 30, 35 years of, of evolu evolving conversations about climate change and global warming. And it's, you know, sometimes it's mainstream and it's, and it's well understood and sometimes it's marginalized and, you know, it's a, it's a four letter word to use some of those terms politically um, because it's, you know, costing industry money or because people really don't want to make change. Um, I think a lot of what we're looking at, if we think about fossil fuels and we think about the things that are driving the changes in our greenhouse that are leading to these, you know, new temperatures and evolving weather patterns and stuff, it means 
we're asking ourselves to change, right? We're asking ourselves to maybe drive less or think about different cars or turn the lights off more or rethink what we eat. Or, you know, there's a lot of things within uh, our daily decisions that if we, if we decide we really wanna make change, it's gonna affect us. And most people don't wanna change. Um, so that's the other one is how do we bring this conversation back so that we can have uh, you know, real discussions about change within our, our community, you know, within ourselves, within our community, and then within our nation, and then within our planet. Um, so that's been a real challenging one. And there's, there's lots of online tools that talk about climate denial and why it's there and what it means and you know how many scientists really believe in it. I mean, you can find an argument if you if you want to search for it, you can find somebody who will say just about anything about climate change. I'll, I'll just add this, like 98% of scientists and people who work within the field, not only believe in it, but are scared of it and are trying to do something about it. So, you know, it, pretty sure it's real, but I, I suggest that you leave that decision up to you and do some research and look into it. Um, but you know, just be careful. Not not all the information out there is supported by the same level of facts and scientific rigor. Um, and then the last one, uh, also again specific to reefs, when you think about the fact that 50 million people on the planet depend on reefs in some way, whether it's because of tourism that's happening in their place, or because of the fish that they eat, uh, or because they want to, um, they just want it to be there because they appreciate how beautiful reefs are when they see them in movies and pictures and whatever, even if they've never been to one themselves. Um, the amount, the amount and importance that reefs have on all these places in the communities, how, how do we better prepare the communities knowing that these places are going to change, um, knowing that even if we have reefs tomorrow, they're probably not going to look like reefs today. The fish that live on those reefs are probably going to be different. Um, the types of tourism that may have to happen in those places is probably going to have to change. So how do we prepare these communities for change? And if you think about it in terms of reefs, you can think about it in terms of anything, right? If, if the boundaries of the rainforest are changing, or if the boundaries of your redwood wood forest are changing, or if the streams are changing so that the fish who usually swim upstream to spawn have to go a different route. You know, how do we prepare these communities and these systems for these changes and better understand what a future might look like? Um, so those are kind of big picture, uh, but if you, if you guys come up with the answer, please send it to me. Uh, and that's that's the last side I had, Milo. I'm willing to open it up to Q&A or anything else that you'd like to um, do with the rest of our time. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. That presentation was both concerning and really inspiring. And um, please, if every student could put at least one question in the chat. And while you're, oh, here we have one. Um, so what is the best part of your job? Uh, I love the field work. So as a NOAA diver, I get to go to some pretty cool and remote places. Uh, we have NOAA ships that come through my region every three years when we're not in this crazy COVID environment anyway, we were supposed to have one come through the last two years and it keeps getting postponed. So um, yeah, you guys are being impacted by this in a major way in these key years of your academics. Um, but trust me, the, the entire world is definitely feeling this particular situation we're in right now. Um, but I've been to reefs in places that only a handful of people in the world have been able to go to. Um, you know, on dives where you have sharks and dolphins in the water together with you. Um, just some pretty amazing stuff in, you know, very beautiful and clear water. Um, I, I first got certified in Seattle and the water there is very cold. And there's also a very high nutrients in the water, which means that it's pretty murky. Um, there are some really big fish and some very cool organisms up there, the giant octopus and stuff. But um, it wasn't really until I got to the tropics and started doing more diving here that I realized just how much I love being in the water. And it's, it's the time that I get to spend in the water that I think is my favorite. That number two would be interactions with students. I take on local students, hauling scholars, opportunities like this to talk with you guys. I love being able to do that. I'm feeling like you might be having an influence um, on a, you know, the next generation is something that I think is really valuable and I, I wish more professionals did it. Hmm. Um, this question is from Aliyah. You've obviously seen corals dying out when diving, but have you ever seen a coral reef be filled with fish and then a few years later it's empty? Yeah, you know, fish are tricky. Um, you can actually have that happen within just a day. <laughs> so if you, if you are on a reef where you have big schools of fish passing through, um, you can think that that reef has just 
this huge biomass of fish there, but fish are dynamic, right? There, there are damsel fish and fish that are affiliated with particular corals that will stay in, in a place, but most fish will move, um, which is one of the challenges that divers even have. And one of the reasons why they've been testing rebreather technology, because just the bubbles that you're making while you're underwater will spook certain fish. So oftentimes when you're doing fish counts, you actually need to start by um, the second you get in the water trying to capture those fish that you know are the most skittish, which usually means like the bigger fish, the predator type fish, because they'll see you and then they'll leave. Um, so, you know, fish are tough, but, but yes, definitely they come and go. And if you have a reef collapse, then they will just go. So they're, they will not be coming back because they, they require um, either other fish there to eat or the right kinds of food, usually like little invertebrates and stuff for them to forage. And if they don't have the right algae, the right invertebrates or the right fish for them to eat, they're not gonna come back. So as a reef collapses and those ecosystem dynamics fall off, you'll have less and less fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stefan asks, do you believe that your mapping of the resilience of reefs has become more accurate? And what were some of the reasons for the older maps inaccuracies? Yeah, definitely become um, more accurate. I think the big difference for us was that first set of data um, was what we would call ended up being baseline data. So we had now this point one in our time series where we knew what the reef looked like. And we made predictions based on that single point on how resilient, how strong we thought that reef was because it had lots of coral or because it had lots of fish uh, or because it was below a watershed that was a really healthy watershed. So be because of those things, we thought, aha, this, this reef is strong. Uh, six years later, we were able to go back and actually see how the reefs did. So it went from that one point in time to two, and all of a sudden, instead of having um, what we call a you know, theoretical resilience, we had what we call a demonstrated resilience. And we could actually say, well, over that six year period, this reef actually demonstrated that it was really strong and it's still healthy, even though we didn't think the watershed was very good. And even though before we didn't think there was enough fish here to manage the algae, we were wrong, this reef did well. But mostly what we saw was the other way. We thought this reef was gonna do well. And then six years later, we came back and we're like, whoa, this reef did not do well. We were wrong. Hmm. Hmm. Mateo asks, what have you seen that has restored your faith in humanity and the world? <laughs> um, that's a really big question. I, I, would, I would say sometimes you've got to narrow your focus a little bit. So if you continue to look super broad and you're hoping to pull that solution out of the sky because you know you, you can get really frustrated because maybe the answer is not always there. Um, I had a daughter four years ago and that changed my focus substantially in, in terms of my professional trajectory, but also like what I'm thinking I want to achieve in terms of my career. And I see the future you know, in you and in, in her and not just what I want to leave as a legacy for myself, for her, but also the tools that I want to give her so that when she gets to these situations, you know, she's also able to make good decisions and form decisions and make change of her own. Um, so, you know, fatherhood <laughs> was a big one. Mm -hmm. um, Riken asks, how long does it take to know whether the attempted introduction of coral in a given location was a success or a failure? Yeah, and we're still in the infancy of that here. Uh, we've got two years or so of growth inside our nursery. We've only done one outplanting, so we call it when we move the coral fragments out to the reef. And th they've only been there for six months. Um, they're all doing well so far, but they also haven't experienced one of these really major bleaching events. Uh, so I think we will know, one, after we've actually had a chance to put more corals out, uh, in the Caribbean, they've had a chance to put a lot more corals out and they've been able to monitor them over extended periods of time. And they have a better idea there of which reef types have done well, which coral types uh, have done better. And so they've been able to prioritize on those. Um, we don't have that information yet. So we're, we're testing it. And that's one of the important things about the pilot study that we're doing is you have to get out there and actually test it in your place because not all places are the same and the tools that work in the Caribbean or even down with our neighbors on Guam won't necessarily translate for us 
just because of very subtle differences in our ecology or in our species or in the species of zooxanthellae that live within the corals. There's a, a lot of nuances there. And so you have to pilot test ideas, even if you're sure they're gonna work, or even if you think there's no chance it's gonna work, um, you still wanna pilot some of these ideas just to see what sticks. And you know that's one of the issues that we've had locally is that there's been a lot of emphasis put on developing management plans. So you've got a restoration plan and you're bringing a bunch of people together to talk about what you hope to do. And while they've been putting those plans together, we've been actually out there putting things in the water and trying to grow them out and seeing what they do. And it'll be interesting to see if the plans align with what we're actually seeing or not, but you, you can't just have one. If you, you, know, you can spend your entire time planning and never actually doing the application. And that's definitely not a place you wanna be. Mm -hmm. Sophia is wondering how long are your trips? And if they're long, how do you work well with your teammates if you're with them for such a long time? Yeah, the longest trips um, that I've been on would be Northern Island cruises. So I mentioned that the Marianas is a 14 island archipelago. Saipan is the fourth one up. So there's been uh, NOAA cruise ships that would go all the way up to the 10 islands that are north of us and then around and back down. And you're on a relatively small ship for a couple weeks, uh, maybe even closer to three weeks with folks on those. And you're spending your time either on dive boats um, with the same people, underwater with the same people, eating in the chow hall with the same people or cleaning and getting ready the next day with the same people. So it certainly is a situation where you can start to rub each other the wrong way if, if you're you know not careful. Luckily, most of the people who work in marine science and most of the people who are out on these cruises um, have a lot of experience being in those situations. And uh, they're, they're pumped up to be there. Like I said, for most of us, even though it does get exhausting. And at some point you feel like a robot out there because you spent so much time underwater, you're just, you know, your head is filled with water. Um, but, but the reality is you spend your entire year or two or three years to get to that point because you want to have those moments when you're underwater. So I'm lucky in that when you are in those situations where you're spending that much time with those people, everybody's pretty excited to be there and realizes how lucky they are to have that opportunity. Now, that being said, <laughs> um, two of the people I've had to deal with in my professional career who I found the most difficult to deal with in my entire you know, 25 years of work, whether it was at the university or at the territorial agency or now with NOAA, um, were folks that I had to deal with on cruises. Uh, one of them was a dive safety officer um, and another one was a fellow scientist. And so when you have those situations, um, I found you just have to minimize your interactions with that person and, you know, to the extent that you can stay professional and check that box when you have to, but don't go out of your way um, to try and, you know, early on, you can sure try to try to fix whatever it is that you think is wrong. But when you realize something is actually broken and you can't really fix it, you just do your best with that change your focus to the extent that you can focus on those partnerships that are meaningful to you that are actually giving you that um you know what you need to be getting out of the experience or what you want to be getting out of the experience ride it out because you're stuck on a boat <laughs> and then move on as soon as you can get off <laughs> uh, so we have time for one more question and jake is wondering where can we find more information about coral health books websites etc yeah, so that, that movie I mentioned, um, we're not screen sharing anymore, right? But the movie I mentioned called Chasing Coral, it's a documentary you can find um, definitely on Netflix and I believe even on YouTube. I think if you just do a Google search for Chasing Coral streaming or something like that, it should point you at your opportunities to watch it. Uh, and that would be a great place to start. Um, yeah. Great, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We're so grateful for the time you've taken today. And that wraps up our recorded portion. 